Hi, I look forward to talking to you today about an exciting new avenue of therapeutics uh, for high-grade dysplasia, as well as other HPV-associated diseases. My name is Mark Einstein. I'm the chair of OBGYN at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in Newark. So we have a lot of commonalities with all the different types of dysplasia that we see. This is a colposcopic view of high-grade CIN. We have cancer that we can see that all of this is related to HPV, and we're spending a lot of time talking about that at this round table. Um, but all this, what I'm showing you is we are surgically managing something that is a virally mediated disease. This is high-grade anal dysplasia. Now, other virally mediated diseases like hepatitis, like COVID, do I cut that out? I'm regularly telling patients now that they have a good understanding of what viruses are like that just because I removed these cells doesn't mean I do anything about the underlying reason behind the pathophysiology of why this happens. When we think about the HPV genome, there's a number of areas uh, that are well known to all of us in the HPV world. All of you are very aware of the late region, the L1, that encodes for the major capsid proteins. Um, L1 is actually what is the target of anti-HPV uh, um, virus-like particles, okay? And that is what causes that high neutralizing antibody response. Typically, therapeutics, though, have targets like E6 and E7 that inactivate tumor suppressor genes P53 and PRB, respectively. So by potentially targeting something that is often integrated into not only dysplasia, but cancer as well. The thinking is with therapeutic vaccines is that in somebody that has like a normal or an adequate immune response, they undergo clearance. And that's the vast majority of patients. And quite frankly, with uh, the high neutralizing antibody responses that are generated with, with routine prophylactic or primary prevention vaccination, we're able to do a lot more clearance. But for those that have potentially no immune response or an inadequate immune response, they're the ones that get persistence. And we know that persistence is what is the, the, the potential stop before dysplasia, all right? And someone probably has to have persistent disease for on the order of about seven to 10 years uh, before they ultimately go to high-grade dysplasia, and then probably another seven to 10 years before they have cancer as well. The other thing is HPV does a very good job in evading the immune system. You know, when somebody gets another DNA virus, they get sick, okay? They get a prodrome. Somebody gets hepatitis, they get sick. Somebody gets COVID, they get sick, okay? Somebody even gets HIV, there's usually a prodrome to that and they get sick, all right? When somebody gets HPV, there's no systemic response. Nobody gets sick. I love it when I tell somebody that they have a new HPV infection, and they're like, oh, I have pain, I have discharge. I'm like, whoa, 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 we got to look into that too, but it's not related to HPV, okay? Uh, this is asymptomatic, and that's the dangerous part of HPV because of its essentially indolent nature. There are very low levels of viral protein that are there, so it doesn't lead to a systemic immune response. And we do know that, the, that ultimately the systemic immune response um, happens um, uh, by getting through this basement membrane, by getting through that those underlying basal cells. Also, HPV replication occurs at a very immunologically isolated site. So again, getting a new infection doesn't cause that systemic response, okay? And we know HPV itself, probably through millennia of evolution, downregulates cell mechanisms such as toll-like receptors uh, uh, expression. That's the initial entry to the innate immune system that causes that systemic response. So why not immunotherapy? I mean, we know anogenital neoplasia and cancer are virally mediated. It makes a lot of sense. And a lot of the current treatment strategies target really essentially ablating the lesion or the surgical management, like what I showed earlier in this talk, okay? But they're not specific for getting rid of HPV. What probably happens though, after we do a leap or after we do a cone, is there is a local immune response that happens that ultimately causes regression. Okay, and, and we know that this, this surgical response is also by removing these portions of the cervix, there is an increased risk of preterm birth, potentially preterm um, uh, delivery as well. Um, there are multiple articles that show that even when um, controlling for some of the confounding risk factors, there is a slight increased risk of preterm birth in people that have had a leap or a cone. The larger we remove, the larger that we resect, the more likely they are of having preterm birth. Okay, so <clears throat> the most early re sin regressions will also go away on their own. So we know there is a big 
potential cellular and humoral immune response that happens that ultimately can cause regression of those dysplastic cells. We know that with most patients that have low grade disease, they will revert to potentially normal pathology on their own. So the rationale is if somebody has an ineffective immune response, they're the ones that are most apt to have persistence, okay? But if somebody has a good uh, cell-mediated immune response, they potentially will undergo regression. And, and the thought is that potentially immunotherapy itself would help to potentially induce more regression than that persistence. So it sort of shifts the paradigm to regression. So there are a lot of different therapeutic vaccine platforms that have developed over the last two to three decades. Some of the simplest ones are the peptide vaccines. They're simple peptides. Sometimes they're combined with local immune modulators, such as Aldera, which is a, a or Miquimod, which is a local immunomodulator. Um, sometimes there are DNA vaccines that are added to it. And then we have some of the more complex vectors that have been developed recently, including a, you know some different types of vaccinia vectors, listeria vectors. And these sound you know kind of scary, but the reason that they're so scary is because they get everywhere, including in these immunologically isolated areas like in the cervical vaginal tract. There are a number of bacterial recombinants and even some more complex type of things like adoptive immunotherapy, cellular therapies that we use for cancer itself, and these are in late stage trials right now in cancer. This is a short list of some of the more recent and some of the past vaccine trials that have been in phase two, and there are actually some of these are in phase three right now. So we might be on the preface of having what might be a medical therapy for something that has historically been surgically removed and something that certainly, if it was available, even for a small percentage of patients, um, remember, the peak age of high-grade dysplasia in the United States is in the late 20s. So, you know, a lot of these women do not want to necessarily have a surgical procedure, um, and rightly so, because if there is a slight increased risk of preterm birth. Um, so maybe we will have a medical therapy, and this will ultimately change some of the ways that we think about how we manage cervical dysplasia and HPV-associated diseases. Thank you very much for your time.